afternoon, everyone. My name is Brandon Olin, and uh, I'm in Dev Black Ops on Twitter. Um, and this session is really is about invoke chat ops, uh, level up, and change your culture with chat and PowerShell. Um, first off, does anyone do chat ops in their organization right now? Couple. Anyone know what it is but haven't done it yet? Who has no clue what this is? Okay, so I think all of you will take something out of this. That's good. Okay. Here's a, uh, some links to this, the slide on speaker deck and um, the code on GitHub that I'll, I'll go over today. Um, the slides aren't really worth anything. The code is interesting though. This is the agenda that I'm gonna go over. Basically, what is chat ops? Uh, what is the specific problem set that this tries to solve? Um, the benefits of, of working in this way, uh, some example frameworks out there, and specifically um, the one that I'm gonna be talking about because I wrote it and this is PowerShell conference. Um, some examples, uh, commands that you would probably do in a chat ops environment. And really the bulk of this is, is an overview of what Poshbot is and a demo and hopefully some time for Q&A, but um, I've given this talk before and it, with an hour and a half and that wasn't even enough time so I'm gonna try to cram through it as much as I can in 45 minutes. All right, so let's get started. What is chat ops? Um, this is a, a pretty succinct uh, definition from James Ryman, um, formerly of GitHub. I think he's still at Stackstorm. Um, and what this really is, is we're taking the things we're already doing, all the work that everyone in here is doing, solving problems on, on systems, and we're putting that in line with the conversations that we're having, and in this case, inside a chat window. And we're putting those concepts together. This is another a little bit uh, longer definition from Atlassian, but basically it says the same thing, is you're taking all these tools, and all these conversations and notifications and putting them in a single interface, um, in a single context. And I'll, and I'll kind of go over some of the benefits of doing that. This is an example problem that, you know, the um, typical Brent problem that this chat ops is trying to solve. So imagine a, a fictional user named Bob, he has a problem and he calls the help desk or chats with someone on the help desk named Sally and says, something's wrong with this server. I don't know what's wrong, can you look at it? Sally is a, a help desk person or, or some type of operations person and she doesn't know what that system is. Brent, our, our favorite person Brent does and um, maybe he can help with this. Two hours later, magic happens. The server is, is fixed. Um, Bob is happy that his problem was resolved. Sally is, is happy that the problem went away and she can close the ticket. But um, there's, there's all kinds of issues that this, this kind of highlights. I'm gonna kind of go over some of what these are. Um, first off, is anyone named Brent in here? I'm sorry that everyone hates you now. Um, yeah. So what are, what are some of the opportunities that this kind of highlights? Um, what chat ops can help with this is uh, it can improve the context. Um, you notice there was a problem, something happened, they fixed it, no one knows what that is, and then the person got notified that it was resolved. Um, Sally never learned anything about that experience, either did Bob, really. Um, so Sally or Bob didn't gain, gain any knowledge on how to fix this particular issue. Um, and neither Sally or Bob were empowered to do this themselves, and ideally, Bob should be able to fix this problem himself. Um, this, this, you know, giving either one of these people access to fix this problem themselves can reduce your mean time to resolution, and ultimately, we want for fewer Brents in the organization, um, not the actual person, we like Brent, um, but he is overworked, he's, you know, critical to the team. If he gets hit by a bus, the world crashes. Um, but we want to we want to reduce um, the the human bottleneck that Brent represents in all of our organizations, and we're all or we all are or we are all have been Brent in our, in our careers. Here's some of the other benefits that chat ops can can bring. Um, like I said, knowledge sharing, empowering the team to fix their own problems, and that's both IT people and business people. It's really anyone in the organization. Situational awareness is everyone knows what's going on. Everyone knows the problem that's happening. It's all in one view. You can enable faster onboarding as people get into the organization. They have a good sense of how that organization works just by looking 
at the chat history of that group. Um, retrospectives or, or you know, blameless postmortems. You can, um, by having all this stuff logged in history, in a permanent history, you have a, basically a flight recorder of, of an incident that you can go back to and, and look at what you did right or what you did wrong in that case. Technical benefits, obviously, this is all driven by automation. Um, like I said, reducing the uh, time to resolution. You have history and logging of everything you're doing here. And ultimately, you can improve safety and in increase security as well. Here are some example frameworks out there. Uh, probably the grandfather of, of most of them is Hubot. Um, and these are all based on di different languages. Hubot is, is written in JavaScript and, and CoffeeScript. Airbot, Python, Cog, Elixir, Ru Ruby, bot framework. Um, there wasn't one for PowerShell, so I created one called PoshBot, and that's what I'm going to go over today. Um, but really, any of these will work for chat ops, and all, all of them work really well for what they're designed to do. Um, but ultimately, if you want to if you want to implement this in your organization, pick something that you're familiar with, that's native to how you work, because um, there's there's really a bot probably in any language out there. Here's some example commands that you can probably you can probably think of a whole lot more that you probably write in a in a in a chat bot. You can restart services. You can get and resolve tickets, query some APIs, modify AD or get AD information. Um, create VMs or change infrastructure in some way. Check processes, get some graphs or performance metrics to help you in troubleshooting. Um, query systems, even to deploy code and kick off pipelines. Um, slap people with trout if you are old enough to get that reference. Um, really anything that you can do PowerShell you can, prop, you can, you can do in a bot. And that's really the, the point of this. So what I'm going to go over today is uh, a, a bot framework I created called PoshBot. It's nearly 100% class-based, PowerShell class-based. And if you saw my session on, on Tuesday, I kind of went over some of the gotchas with classes that I learned by writing this bot. Modules, PowerShell modules become chat ops commands in the bot. And that's really what this, um, what this gives you, is you can, if you can write a PowerShell module and you can write functions, you can execute them in a chat bot. It's in, with really very little, if any, extra effort than that. It has a notion of uh, role-based access control. You obviously want to secure some of these commands from people. Not everyone should be able to execute everything. Um, I'll go over some triggers and scheduled commands and some of the other functionality that the bot will give you that you may, you may find interesting to enable certain scenarios, um, such as you know, parameter injection, stateful data, blacklist and whitelist for commands and channels. There's an asterisk under multiple chat networks, and I know someone will ask me about Teams, and I'll, I'll give you the answer about why there's an asterisk there. But really, this is written, since it's written in classes, you can extend classes and implement um, this framework on multiple chat backends. But primarily, I use Slack, and this is written and tested on Slack the most. So that's it, really, for the, for the slides. Let's get into a demo. Does anyone have any questions? Just off the bat? No? OK. It's really loud over there. OK. So let's go off and, and start the bot. This is a, a simple script I have here to, to, start, to start the bot. We're going to import the module. We're going to import a configuration file, which is really just an, a PowerShell object that has a lot of um, uh, configuration lines on how the bot is going to behave. We're going to set some runtime specific configuration that I'll show you later in that, in that middle section about plugin configuration, and I'll show you how that works. We're going to create an instance of a chat backend that the, the bot is going to reference. In this case, I'm going to give it a, a Slack API token. That, uh, that's how it's going to authenticate to Slack and, and make a connection. And then I'll create the bot and start it. And later on, I'll also show you how you can write a very simple script that's to run this as a service. You can also run this in a container as well. I've tested that. So let's go ahead and start this.
So you got all that verbose output, right? All right, so we can see our, our bot here is now green. That green is good. So let's go, uh, actually we need to invite him. So now that bot will be listening on this channel and, and receiving commands. All right, so let's, let's run a command here. Let's see if it's up. Okay, good, we have status. We can see our bot returned uh, some output. So, um, one of the, the most frequent things you're probably going to be running when, you, when you're doing chat ops in your organization is help. You're going to have lots of commands in here, and you're not going to be sure how they, exactly how they operate. So let's, let's run a, a help command for get plugin. There's a lot of um, built-in commands to Poshwat, and they mostly have to deal with importing and managing um, modules, or in this case, I call them plugins, and also some user management. Uh, not a whole lot of you know, chat ops goodness other than just getting the bot functional. Internally, what this is doing is, in, is in using get help on PowerShell functions and then consuming that and making it visible inside Slack. So let's actually look at the help for help. You can see you can get uh, detailed or examples, and that's really just the normal get help syntax. You can see you can get the normal help that you would expect from PowerShell. All right. So what do we have installed right now? Just one built in. You can see there's a whole bunch of commands here. Like I said, mostly just to deal with plugin management and user management. Let's go ahead and install a plugin. And when I say plugin, this is just a PowerShell module. I, I call them plugins because you can add some extra metadata to them to make them operate differently inside the bot. But these these modules are they're just modules, and you can execute them from the command line command line like any other module. Let's go ahead and install one. Oh, I'm sorry. Find plugin. What this is going to do is actually search the PowerShell gallery for modules that have Poshbot in the name or have a Poshbot tag. So any of these you can just import right away. Uh, most of these I created, like Dilbert and Giphy and Tic-Tac-Toe and, and things, Wolfram. Just fun stuff, just demo stuff really to get, to get going. I was happy to see that someone created a VMware module out there. Um, that really just, you know, that showcases the real benefit of using this is actually getting real work done. That, mod, that plugin will snapshot and remove snapshot, snapshots from VMs right from Slack. Let's go ahead and install some of these. I already have these actually installed on my machine, but uh, if I didn't, they would just get installed from the gallery like a, like a normal plugin or a normal module. Anyone know what name it is? That you do? Do you use it? Yeah, I, do. yeah, I, I like it. It's um, what name it is is it's a it's a simple um, module out there that just generates random text for test data. So if you want to generate a whole bunch of addresses or people, you can use name it to generate stuff like that. I like to highlight it because it has nothing to do with Poshbot whatsoever. It just generates random strings, but you can import it into Poshbot and, and execute this stuff right from Slack. So let's, let's try, so it has a person command, or a function. You can go and run that, and you can see it ex executed the command and gave us the results. Internally, what Poshbot is doing is executing these commands in a job, sucking out the, the various verbose and output and error streams, output streams, and, and giving you the results back in Slack. It'll also know if that command had failures and it'll mark it as such. You can see this one had no, nothing in the output, or the error stream. So it assumes that that command uh, was successful. If anyone has any questions, you can speak up, you know, as well. Yeah. So 
It started on a my credentials. You can run it as a service and run it under whatever user you want. Um, the the um, the jobs will also run under that whatever that user is. Um, and I'll show you um, what the correct way probably is to run functions that would need credentials to go do something else because you wouldn't want to run it. You wouldn't want to run Poshbot as an elevated user. So I created a, oops, that's wrong. Give me back an error. Hi, Don. PS submit. Okay, so here's a set of, of example commands that I've written to, to show you some of the various capabilities of the bot. So before I do that, I'm gonna go over the concept of triggers. Triggers are how, um, how these commands get executed. Normally, in the most common way, is gonna be just normal command triggers. I say bang and a command name, and I execute that command. Um, and I'll show you, and that's what I've been doing up to this point. This is also configurable. You can use a different character other than bang, but that's a common one. So let's execute this uh, get hello world command. Oops. So you can see we get some PowerShell output that's familiar to us. Mandatory parameter was not provided. That command didn't work. Marked it as failed. Let's actually look at that command. So. There's absolutely nothing special about that function other than it requires a mandatory parameter and it, you know, it returns some output. They're namespaced, I'll show you that. It's a good, good question. So. Let's satisfy the parameter, and we'll get back a result. So that's the example of just a normal command trigger, and that's the most common. Um, and particularly Slack and other chat networks as well emit events when things are happening on the network that aren't people chatting in a window. You know, people join and, and leave you know, channels, channels get created, topics get changed. Um, so you can trigger based on those events as well. So let's try changing the topic. And that's going to emit event, an event that Poshbot is going to see and execute a command. And we can see what this function would look like. And this is where you, you start adding Poshbot specific metadata to these commands to make them operate differently. And the bulk of this is really this custom attribute that I created that you can tell you can decorate your, your functions with, and when Poshbot imports these, it's gonna treat these differently and trigger them differently. So here you can say, it's not an actual command trigger that I'm gonna execute. I want you to trigger on an event, and specifically the channel topic changed event that the backend is gonna receive from the, from, the, from the chat network. And when that event gets happened, it's going to trigger this. This type of uh, command obviously you can't pass input to it because the user is not actually directly invoking this command. So just a caveat there. Yeah. Can it grab information about the event? Like can it see what the topic changed to? Yes, I'll show you that. So the second, that's probably the least common trigger is events because they're not really all that useful. Um, regex is, another, is, is gonna be the second most common you can trigger based on you know, the command matching some arbitrary regex string. So if, I, if someone just types some text in here, it's going to match that to a command, you know, if, if it had some commands that were triggered on regex. So let's look at what that does. So that was uh, my, my cookies function. And again, I'm telling you, it's not a true command, it's going to trigger on regex and specifically cookies. So you can put whatever regex expression you want in there and it will trigger on this. I don't know why this keeps scrolling to the top. So 
So again, same thing. I'm going to trigger on ship it anytime I see ship it in the string. And I'm going to pick a random squirrel and give him, give him a squirrel. So, and all I'm doing is doing a write output. Slack will see that as just a URL that it got responded to, and it'll automatically unfurl it. So, those aren't too useful, unless you really like squirrels. So, let's do a little bit more complex thing. Get multiple things. I didn't give it anything. It's just going to return with empty parameters that it received. But let's, uh, let's give it a little bit complex thing. Let's give it an array of strings and an integer. So you can see that the parameter thing1 received three things. It automatically parsed that and recognized it, it was an array. And thing2 was, a, was an integer. So let's look at that function and see how that operates. There's, there's nothing to pop spot specific in there. All I'm doing is accepting two parameters to, with uh, the collections and then returning their output. But Poshbot will parse that string that, and similar to basically the AST. So anything you type at the command line, or I say command line in Slack, it's basically what it is. Um, it's, gonna be, it's gonna get parsed similar to just PowerShell on the command line because internally it's using the AST to tokenize these things and break them up. So it's not, it's not just taking your string and doing like an invoke expression. You can't do like parameter, you know, PowerShell injection. It's going to actually look at, analyze what you typed in here and do a whole bunch of stuff behind the scenes. So we all write perfect PowerShell every time. We can also, Poshbot will recognize errors or, or exceptions that the command emits and mark that command as failed and also return those back and mark them that, hey, this command had a failure because it's reading the error stream of, of, the, of the job that it's executing these under. And again, there's nothing specific in here. I'm just saying write error. Let's do a little bit more complex thing because sometimes we want pretty output. Let's create a VM, give it some of the parameters. So, oh, we didn't pass our parameter validation for CPU, we gave it too much. Let's make that happy. So, I created a fic fictional server right there. I wish they were that quick. Um, and you can see that function, I said create VM to create it, but you can see that the command, the actual PowerShell function had create dash VM. Now if I try to run that, Poshbot's gonna know what, not gonna know what that is. Because I told Poshbot to disregard what the actual function name is, I want it to be called create VM without a dash. So you can override the function name and call these things whatever you want, internal to Poshbot. And you can see I'm doing, doing some normal parameter validation, returning a, a, an object. The special thing here I'm doing is I'm, instead of just returning a string or an object to the output stream, I'm calling new Poshbot card response and telling it a title and some text, which I formatted. And it'll return the title here and the text. So you can tell within your command how to, to you know, do some more custom formatting for the responses to your command. You can just return arbitrary text, but if you want it to look pretty, sometimes uh, a Slack card is useful. Any questions on that? No? Uh, yeah. Have you done anything with the interactive card itself? A little bit. Um, that's gonna involve some two-way communication yeah. between Slack. Um, I haven't done any coding on it yet, but I've thought about how to to work on that. That involves exposing Poshbot to the internet so Slack can communicate directly to it. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. Let's do another command here. Get random number. We'll get a random number. Now we can also say R&D or RAND. 
and also execute that same command. So we have the notion of aliases as well. And you can do that in PoshBot by just specifying an alias property on the, the attribute to, to say this command is also known by these arbitrary other things. It's really annoying that this keeps on popping up. All right, so here's a little bit more complex example is permissions. Um, it would be great if everything could be executed by everyone. Obviously, that can't happen. We need to secure some of these commands, especially if they're going to make changes to the environment or do some sensitive uh, operations. Let's, um, let's run this command called get secret plan. I don't, have author I don't have authorization to run that command. Let's see why not. Help get secret plan. This command requires a permission here, which I don't have. So you can tag commands with permissions. It's, since I'm an admin, I'm going to give myself permission. I'll just copy this so I don't have to type it. So I'm going to add the poshbot get secrets permission to the admin role, which I'm a member of. Okay. Let's run get secret plan again. Okay, it worked. But I didn't get the output directly where I typed that command. That sensitive information, it DM'd me that information. So and internally, what it actually just uploaded some CSVs to Slack. So you can do uploads as well of just arbitrary files. So that get secret plan said, you need to have that get secrets permission to be able to execute this. You can have one or more permissions. You need to be a member of at least one of them. And I'm also running this custom function called new poshbot file upload, giving it a path to a file and a, uh, a title. And I'm also saying DM this response back to the calling user. If you don't have that, it's going to respond back to the channel that it received the message in. All, that all clear? Please? Okay. So we can also give that to another user. Let's let's say let's call a henchman role. We'll add that permission to that role and we'll Create also a group. People get added to groups. I'm going to add my alter ego to that group as well. So now my other user here can also run. No, not get secrets. Get a secret plan. So now he's authorized to execute that command as well. So you can you can inline in Slack give people access to execute commands. You can also mimic. Um, sometimes you want to give that little extra confirmation before you execute a command. So if I want to remove something called foo, it's going to say, are you sure you want to do that? And I say, yes, I'm sure. So let's use the force switch, because we always love that. And you can see it's going to execute, and it recognized that that was three items that I passed in. It's going to operate on each one of them. And that is, um, remove something. Internally, I'm just saying, did you pass the force switch? If not, Let's return a warning back to the user. If they did pass a force switch, let's actually do what they asked us to do. So there's nothing really Poshbot specific there. That's just Im imitating the force uh, functionality. So everything I've been doing so far has been one at a time, command one at a time. But if this is a busy channel, you got lots of people loving the chat ops and executing stuff. You want things to run in parallel. 
let's run a long command that's going to go off and do something. And we can also run other commands as well while that long running command has gone off and doing its thing. These are all executed as jobs, so they're all se completely separate from each other. And eventually, that long running command is going to complete in three, two, one, zero. OK, there it is. So I mentioned scheduled commands at the beginning a little bit. Um, you can do some basic scheduling with PostBot. If you want to do really advanced things like run this thing on the third Friday on, you know, on the full moon, that's not what this is for. This is basic, this is basic intervals to do execute commands. You want to execute this thing once a day at 7 a.m. to give you some type of status or something like that and have it available when you get in the, get in the office. Let's see, we don't have any scheduled commands right now. Man, get help, these are all aliases for the same command. Let's see what, what commands match schedule. And you can see some right here. These are all the commands that deal with setting and, and removing scheduled commands. Let's look at the, the new schedule command. We can see the syntax for it. We actually need a special permission to be able to schedule commands. I'll just copy this. So I'm going to create a new schedule to run the status command every 10 seconds. You can run things on hours, seconds, minutes, days. So now we have one. We can see it listed there. And there's the output of the status command. That formatting is not very well. There, it executed again. Let's shut that up because that's way too often. Let's remove that. So that's basic scheduling of commands right there. Whatever you whatever you type um, right here, it's basically whatever you would type with bang command, parameters, whatever you want to put in that string, that's what's going to get executed. And it can, it's going to get executed in the context of the user who scheduled it. So if that, if that user doesn't have permissions to run that, that command is going to fail because they don't have the permissions to run it. So here's a little bit more advanced thing. And this is command approvals kind of give you the ability to do the, you know, to launch the missile, you need to have two people turn the keys and approve it before it launches. You can enable that for particularly sensitive commands and you want to force that someone else approves this before you run it. Are you listening? There it is, okay. That's a bug that I gotta fix. So this command needs approval by someone else. And it says, you need to have someone in the admin or release groups approve this. And to, for them to approve it, go ahead and run this. So let's go to my alter ego and have him do it for me. Actually, before that, let's see if we can do it. Because we're an admin. And no, we can't. <laughs> you, can, you can enable that if, you, if, that if you're cool with that. You can approve your own stuff. That's not by default, though. So with my alter ego, can he do it? No, because he's not in the admin or the release groups. So let's go. Let's go. Be nice to him, and let's let's go create a release group, and we'll add we'll add him to it. Thank you. All right. Did it notify? Um, not out of the box. That, that, that would be a good that would be a good use case to do that. So we can also see the uh, anything that's pending, and these will eventually time out. That's configurable by default. It's going to be thirty minutes for that person to approve it. Otherwise, that command's going to go away. So let's go ahead and approve it. You can see it right there that he approved it, and then the output gets. Command behind the scenes gets executed. Yeah. So I assume it's doing a technical job to 
it, all of these commands get executed as jobs, just normal PowerShell jobs. Yeah. So you can also, of course, deny something. You know, if I want to run this again, and I want to say prod. Have this have my boss say, nope, not gonna do that. Channel rules. You can also control what commands get executed in what channels. Even Poshbot will have to be listening on that channel, but maybe you don't want to allow Giphy in the management, you know, channel. So let's go back to the general. And you can see my practice right there. Nope, can't do that, because I've disallowed it. And I'm taking a, taking a chance by executing Giphy here. But every time I've run PowerShell, it's been completely safe. So, so we'll get something from Giphy. So how do we enable that is, uh, let's look back at our, I haven't shown you this bot configuration. The, oh, these are the approvals. This is also the configuration where you define what commands need to be approved by what people. So I'm gonna say 30 minutes, the command's gonna expire. Anything matching that expression, plugin, command, version, and it's just wildcards are accepted as well. And then an array of groups that, that you need to be in to approve that. Channel rules, similar thing. And these go in the order of these go from most specific to least specific. So you can say in the, general, in the general channel, allow every command, but also exclude anything from the poshbot.giphy plugin. Otherwise, just allow everything in every channel. And you can, you can be pretty granular with these rules if you want to. So that's channel rules. So everything I've been executing up to this point has been logged. So we can see our history. We can see a whole bunch of commands have been executed, a bunch of data about that. We can look at a specific one. Get a little bit, little bit more information about it. What com ex explicit command they ran, who did it. Optionally, if that was a command that required approval, who approved it. And also, all of that is also written to a log here that you can configure your retention with. I've got to refresh that. Refresh, come on. So in a JSON file, you have a whole bunch of information about what message re was received from Slack, um, what the command was, what the output of the command is, who approved it, you know, all kinds of information here, and you can ship this off to some type of log aggregator if you want to analyze it. There's also a detailed log of what the bot is doing internally as well. And all that's, you can, the retention for all those you can configure. So, those are all commands that don't have any credential needs, you know, to getting those. So, this is kind of an interesting one, is Wolfram. You, everyone know what Wolfram Alpha is? That's a really cool website to go ask information of. So I have a command here, and actually I, got the, I stole this from Doug Fink. This is like four lines of PowerShell to, to hit the Wolfram API. So I have this ask Wolfram command. Anyone know what this is? Real quick, guess? All right, 25 miles an hour. So, so that requires an API that you can get, you know, freely from Wolfram to go hit that. You know, also Google's URL uh, shortener also requires an API key. I can give it something that's going to return me back a response. So let's look at how that happens because the um, the Wolfram module is out in the gallery, but I don't want to ship my API key out with that. So let's look at how you can enable to ship modules that require credentials and have the, uh, have those credentials be supplied at runtime. So let's look at the shortened one because that's the one that's right here. Again, I'm renaming it to shorten. And I have this other attribute here that's attached to a, a mandatory parameter called API key. And I'm saying 
when this command gets executed by Poshbot, and dynamically insert the value of that configuration that's going to pull from the bot configuration and supply it to the command. And it's basically going to splat it like you would normally when you splat commands to functions. And you can see back in my start Poshbot that I was dynamically setting that configuration for the Wolfram module, giving it a value of API key, giving, setting it something that I've already set, but normally you'd probably want to pull this from a credential store or something like that. But Poshbot will say, okay, well I need an API key, go get it from um, this configuration, arbitrarily named, you can give it whatever you want. And this could be a credential, it could be a string, integers, whatever kind of data you want that you don't want to ship with your module, you can stick in here. So that's uh, parameter injection, and that's really useful to make, like VMware plugin, obviously you're not gonna ship credentials with that. That's gonna be specific to every environment. Also the URL for vSpanner, things like that. You don't want those to be mandatory parameters on the commands, but you can't ship them with the module. The bot, you know, the person who's running the bot is gonna have to set that up, this configuration. So uh, these are all executed as jobs, meaning that they're stateless effectively. You know, the job runs some code and gets destroyed. There are some use cases where you would want a command to run and then run again and also have the state from the previous run. So you could, you could roll that your own if you wanted to. So I'm gonna run this get my stuff and I didn't provide what I wanted to get. So let's say I wanna get the value of foo and I don't have anything. So set my stuff, let's set set some values here and we'll go retrieve that value okay I got a value there and what that was internally doing was setting a file here specific to the module and it's really just export CLI data so I, I just dumped some data that Postbot will make available to the command if it requests it so that set my stuff command is using uh, a function uh, created by Warren Frame when he added to Poshbot some ability to set data that was helpful. Okay, so your question about um, like, I think it was about who was executing the command or a little bit of extra context to the function about who was running these commands. I got a little bit of a few minutes here, so let's uh, let's show you what that looks like. This is all the data that you have available to you when you execute a command. This is a global object that I insert in the job that shows you, you know, who executed the command, what was the message that it received from the network, and you can do what you want with this data. So if you want to do extra validation about um, the actual specific user that executed that what channel it was in, you know, things like that. You can, you can do with that what you want. And the stateful data, uh, let's see. There's also another thing you can do with this. So let's, let's actually play a game with it. Games have state. And I don't have any active games, but I, let's create a new one. Okay, we got a game. Let's play. And then here we'll join. and then go back and forth and have, basically this command reads in that state data, rehydrates the game, plays it, saves it back to the disk every time. You could probably come up with something more useful than tic-tac-toe, but that was something fun to play with. So, namespace, you mentioned um, multiple commands that had the same name. 
internally, Poshbot has namespaces. So the actual command that gets executed is the plugin colon name colon version. So you can be specific and, and actually import multiple versions of modules and execute different versions of that command. Um, I don't have really enough time to show you that, but you can, this is how you do it. You would just do a fully qualified name here. Same with disabling and, okay, so I got to run out of time here. So you can also run it as a service. Here's a little document on how to do that. This is on the, doc, the poshbot, the docs.poshbot.io site. This is all the documentation I have. It's pretty complete. Um, Okay, so that's it with the demo. Why aren't you showing up? There we go. Okay, so how you can get kind of started with chat ops is starting small, read-only information. Um, don't go start creating VMs and destroying things right off the bat. Um, also tell your security folks that you're probably doing this would be a good idea. Um, make it easy to do the right thing. Put parameter validation. Make it very easy to write the, to run the commands the correct way. Provide sane defaults. So kind of fall into that you know pit of success when these things get executed. You can uh, get a champion um, to kind of help evangelize this way of working um, to your organization. You know, obviously you want to you want to write commands that solve problems that are probably time sucks that are very easy to, to to solve and also take up a lot of your time. I would focus on those commands first. Creating VMs and stuff like that would be something that you could potentially look at. Um, and make it fun. Do fun things with this. You know, make it make it a joy to work with. You know, day to day. Um, this is where you can find me, Dev Black Ops, on Twitter. My blog is totally out of date. Not a lot of useful information up there. Um, but I am active on Twitter and GitHub quite a bit. Um, these are other projects that I work on. So Saki, I'm the, I'm the, recently I became the maintainer of that, uh, that project. Uh, you know, various Postbot plugins, Postbot itself. Uh, there's some testing-based frameworks and stuff like that. There's a whole bunch of stuff you can check out on my GitHub. So that's all I have. Thank you. <laughs>